and we're back. We're sitting here with the operator and owner of Crested River, Sean Weber. Thanks for coming, Sean. Thanks for having me. So I'm really excited to dig in today a little bit to your business to talk a little bit more about the co-op and the industry council. But before we do that, can you take us through a little bit about what your background is and what brings you to the industry? Sure. Um, uh, my background is uh, I've been a cannabis enthusiast since 1997. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I got into the industry back in 2016, 2017, just helping out friends and family uh, find and source uh, CBD products at a, at a reasonable price. If we remember back then, bottles of oil were going for well over $100. Um, and there wasn't uh, a lot uh, understood, uh, but um, a couple of my friends and family had good experiences, and so we wanted to ride that wave. Uh, and that's initially how I learned about CBD. And then as I did research, I learned about the hemp program that opened up in 2018 we immediately started uh, uh, developing a business plan and formally incorporated uh, Crested River in 2019 after several years of just um, uh, doing some buying and selling. Uh, but once Crested River was um, uh, incorporated, that's when we started manufacturing. Very cool. And you're out in Morgan, Minnesota, correct? Yes, Morgan. Two hours west of here, small town of 900, 700, or 974 people. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I remember coming out to your shop for the first time and sort of driving through rural Minnesota, driving through Gaylord, sort of getting down to Morgan and being like, this isn't exactly where I'd expect a, a cannabis business to be. And you roll in and it's pretty cool walking into your shop. And the at the time you were growing in there and that smell of the plants just hit you when you walked in. It was a pretty cool experience in a pretty small town. Yeah, right on. Well, I appreciate that. How has the town taken to your business? Uh, they've, they've accepted us from day one. Um, you know, being a small town, uh, having grown up there, uh, everybody knew who I was. Mm -hmm. um, my dad had uh, paved a pretty solid path for me. He was a, a business owner in town for over 30 years, well-respected. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I set up shop, um, I was treated as a legitimate business more so than anything mm -hmm. stigmatized with uh, cannabis. Very cool. Very, very cool. What were you doing prior to cannabis? You mentioned sort of like... Uh, logistics, sourcing, what, what was that? Yeah, so my background is industrial automation, so robotics, mm -hmm. uh, pneumatics, electromechanical, anything that moves, anything that's, um, you know, moves something from point A to point B, um, that's my expertise. And so mm -hmm. I work for a company called Festo, um, based out of Germany. We did about $6 billion a year globally. Mm -hmm. Uh, my specialty was uh, food and beverage industry segment specialist. So mm -hmm. I um, I traveled to the 3M uh, plants, craft plants, general mills, uh, Bosch packaging. I worked with engineers to help them design and build equipment. And then I also trained them in the Food Safety Modernization Act. Very cool. Very, very cool. It's a German company. And today, Germany has legal cannabis. It's right? Like funny yeah. timing. It's a... Uh, it's, I, it's I saw on LinkedIn you're you're gonna head over there, right, and start selling uh, Crested River products. No, no, um, no. It is, it is interesting how they did legalize it over there. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have a market. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did not legalize it for manufacturing. It's just home grow. So, I have seen a couple things pop up where people are like, "Hey, how do we get into Germany and um, grow a plant and buy a house?" Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And mm -hmm. that's the other thing. I mean, we can go off on a tangent, but. The German European market is nothing like the United States. Mm -hmm. So when you have consumer packaged good manufacturers saying, hey, how can we get in the German market? The answer is blow up everything you've done in the United States and start from scratch in Europe. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to replicate anything you're doing here in Europe. Interesting. It would be illegal. Okay. Totally. They have much higher standards. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, going back to 2019 and now looking five years, five years later, was white labeling and producing other people's products, was that part of your original business plan? Not necessarily part of the original business plan. Um, but once we got into it, it was a critical pivot. Um, the original business plan was perpetual golden brick roads. Right? CBD, CBD is new. CBD is new. Mm -hmm. um, you taught me about CBG for the first time. Right on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so... You know, we, 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 we try to take off our rose-colored glasses. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about cannabis, 
and we're talking about CBD, um, the thing was endless, right? So mm-hmm. our business plan, we accounted for saturation, but nothing like a 50 to 75% pullback like mm-hmm. you should expect. Mm-hmm. And so when we, when we positioned ourselves, you know, I always knew that I wanted to do white label manufacturing. Um, you know, my product was a means to an end, but at the same time, um, I didn't realize how significant that pivot would be. But, uh, but yeah. I mean, being in the industry in 2019, like you saw that initial crash of the price of like the initial kilo price, like going 40 X lower than what it was in the beginning of the year. Yes. So when did you begin to realize that you could add more to what your, just your crest or just your Philatomo product line and go further with Crested River? Like, well, when, when the market tanked that, I mean, the input costs came down dramatically, mm-hmm. but the, the premium that you could charge also should have come down dramatically. It did not. <laughs> I remember you saying that. Yeah. Um, it was fascinating how I was paying close to $8,000 a liter mm-hmm. for full spec CBD. And then, I mean, today I'm buying full spec CBD for 500 bucks. Okay. Um, totally. So in theory, your, your products or the products of the industry should be proportionally at least half as much. And, and, and they, have, they have come down half as much, but mm-hmm. there was about a three-year lull, two to three-year lull where, mm-hmm. I mean, people were still charging well over $100 for a 1,000 milligram bottle of oil. And starting in COVID, starting the summer of COVID, that's when we completely redid our pricing model and we've been selling, you know, that's when we started selling 1,000 milligram bottles for 30 bucks. Um, you know, we were making pennies on the dollar that everybody else was, but I felt that that was a fair ethical price. Yeah, I, I still think CBD is is overpriced and under underdosed. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sort of talking a little bit about that, you, I think, more than most people that I know in the industry are actively involved on that activism side of not just sort of doing the day job of running your business, but also looking at our larger industry and saying, how can we organize and how can we work towards changing these laws in a way that makes them better? Can you talk a little bit about why, I mean, essentially, why is activism important to you? Why do you continue to stay involved instead of just saying, well, this is good enough, I can run my business and then sort of focusing on just that? And also, and because I know that's a tough question, but like along your journey, let's say the last five years, like when did you really start to realize, hey, I need to put my voice into the mix here. I need to stand up for what I believe in. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, very good questions, very hard questions. I mean, honestly, I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. I just feel an inherent re- responsibility. Um, you know, I have very strong personal convictions. Um, I mean, I I just think that we all should, but it's it's hard for me to demand that of other people because for the longest time, I sat there and I just kind of looked at people that were activists and all other walks of life. And I'm like, well, that seems like a waste of time or all that seems very noble of them, but what are they getting out of it? And that, those were kind of the things that I thought about in the back of my mind, not judging them or anything. And now that I find myself involved in these things, I don't think my, I don't think of myself as an activist. I don't see myself as an activist. I just feel like I'm doing what I feel is inherently responsible of me as an industry player. Hmm. Um, knowing that I'm, not getting paid for my time. Um, will I get something out of it? Uh, I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. care. I'm the mindset there is simply, I want to be part of something bigger than I am and better than I am. And if we can make this happen, I'm better off for it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm as strong as the community around me. I, I could, I could be sitting on top of the world and everybody around me could be failing, but that doesn't, do anything for us collectively, yeah. right? So yeah, I totally. Don't, I don't know how to answer the question other than I just I feel an inherent responsibility to to be involved in and recognizing that, like, I'm just starting this. Mm-hmm. Like, even in 2019, I was just starting. Um, we've had people doing this for five, 10, 15, 20 years, and then of course we've got people that have been incarcerated for even longer, yeah. and and yeah. so I. I recognize that I'm standing on shoulders of giants and I'm just trying to carry the torch until some, the next person picks it up. So 
No, I appreciate that. I mean, I think you will fit into sort of a line of activists in our state, be it people pushing for decriminalization back in the 70s or pushing for medical in like the early aughts. I think continuing to strive towards how can we have a better cannabis industry is something that makes the Minnesota industry really unique is that we have so many operators that at their core, I think are in this just because they want a better cannabis industry. Sure. So thanks for being part of that chain. Oh, thanks for having me. So uh, touching a little bit on the activism side, um, you've mentioned a few times about sort of being involved in that legislative component. Can you talk about some of the changes that you're hoping to see upcoming at this session and then also some of the changes that maybe you're a little bit concerned about in this upcoming session? Okay. Um, the changes that I'd like to see, now, <clears throat> I, I've learned a lot in the last year. And that is um, pray for the worst, hope for the best, mm -hmm. or pray for the best, mm -hmm. hope for the worst. Yeah. Um, and I also understand that there's a thing about operating in good faith, and I also understand that you can't control everything. So that said, um, the goal last year was to legalize, mm -hmm. and we did it. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a lot of things that were in the bill that we didn't agree with, but if you read the bill and understood the bill, mm -hmm. we had time to address those things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of items that were not addressed last year that I hope will get addressed this year, if not next year, and that is a couple of arbitrary line items that were not pushed by any one individual. They weren't done for any other reason other than ignorance, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. We have legislature legislators that know a lot, but not as much as we do. Oh, yeah. They also understand that if you have an industry writing legislation, they're probably going to be implementing loopholes mm -hmm. and be a little loosey-goosey. So. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that uh, all of the recommendations that got submitted, there was a couple creative edits made by the legislature that weren't done for any reason other than, hey, we think we're holding the industry accountable. Mm -hmm. um, they now know that those were done incorrectly, like the cannabinoid caps. Yeah, that's exactly the one that I was thinking so, of, 0.5 uh, milligrams of CBN. Correct. I mean, um, it reminds me of what Jerry Collins was saying a couple of weeks ago. He's like, Minnesota legislators, they just want to make their own wheel. And, or, you know, it's like, yeah. you, you know, they want to they they make it special in Minnesota. And sure. It's like, no, just, just do what makes actual sense. Do what makes actual sense. I mean, I talked to the person that wrote the bill, and I asked him these specific questions. And he said, he's like, well, Sean you guys are only looking out for yourself. And I'm like, I can appreciate that, but now you actually need to listen. Like what you put in there does not make sense. What you put in there has nothing to do with the price of tea in China. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so we have to make a legislative change. Um, and there's, so between the approved cannabinoids, mm -hmm. um, the cannabinoid caps, um, and don't get me wrong, there's one or two others, but they're, I don't lose sleep over this stuff. Mm -hmm. I know that they need to be addressed. I hear a lot of people insisting that those changes are already implemented, and you try to correct those people and those oh, yeah. voices. Um, but I'm, I'm happy with the legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, there is work to do. Uh, those are a couple points that I made. And then the, the proposed changes... We don't have a lot of information on these new proposed changes on this H we're going to call it the OCM bill. Mm -hmm. um, the number escapes me. They're talking about the, the mayor. They're talking about going to a lottery way from a merit. Mm -hmm. um, they're not proposing anything other than the conversation. Would I like to see a lottery system? No. Do I want to see a merit based system? Absolutely. Is it going to be a hybrid mm -hmm. of the two that we may end up with to prevent any sort of litigation? Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Could we have a social equity pathway and a public pathway? Um, hybrid system, possibly. We need mm -hmm. to operate in good faith, communicate in good faith, you know, negotiate in good faith through these topics. And that's how the original bill was last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a complete rewrite. We lost 60 to 90 days because of a lot of the back and forth about the confusion. Mm -hmm. um, and what I learned from last year is patience and focus. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of peripheral noise, a lot, and we just need to stay focused. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think three years ago you would have seen a lot of first time founders, and I think last year we saw a lot of first time going through that legislative process, trying to get a bill passed, and mm-hmm. just not being super familiar with the political process, and oh, yeah. thinking that politics is like regular business. Mm-hmm. No, it's much different. I think right. Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely, and there's we all have our own opinions of how government works and they're primarily negative. Mm-hmm. And, and if you've ever gone through the process, you would probably even have a more negative opinion about it. But the fulfillment after successfully seeing some legislation through mm-hmm. all bay with some tweaks is, is, is it's pretty neat. Yeah, it, it is pretty. Oh neat. yeah. I, I think we oftentimes, especially since the legislative session has begun, focus so much on what are the changes that are being talked about? How can we change our program? But it's we sort of lose sight of the fact that we did legalize cannabis. Like a year ago, we were having people arrested for holding cannabis in their pockets or whatever be it. And now that's that's I mean happening with large enough amounts. But <laughs> generally speaking, not a not a problem for most home consumers, which is, I think, pretty. I mean, that's a major change. Yeah. And and. The sad thing is, is I don't think a lot of us got to sit back and reflect on what we had accomplished. Mm-hmm. It was, it was either a, get your mind back into your business, or b, get ready for round two next year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think you know part of that, part of what we can attribute that to is the hemp derived market, which yep. is allowing us to play in the shallow end of the pool while people. Uh, develop the the more deep end in the pool or decide if they even want to play on that side of the of the industry so how hard was it to operate your business and be active in the legislature in the legislation and you know have a have a life i mean that was last year a pretty challenging time (laughs) um it was insanely difficult um i mean you're two hours away from the city's plus right yeah, so I, I have a two-hour drive. So whether I was coming to the cities to sell or coming to the cities to, um, you know, work on legislation, yeah, it, I had four hours a day on the road that was, well, that's when I got to catch up on emails, I guess, and phone calls. <laughs> um, no, it was, it's hard. Um, yeah, It's very hard, and, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I'm not, going to say that I'm jealous of these other brands that weren't active in legislation because they were focused on their brands. Um, yeah, I mean, good for them. Great. Awesome. Um, I'm kind of jealous of you, but at the same time, you know, I get to go home at night knowing that maybe I helped a little bit and I don't know. I think that's kind of neat. I think you can relate to that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think there's a lot of people in the industry that sort of have that experience of being able to look at legalization and say, you know, maybe I had a couple community meetings around that, or maybe I called a couple legislators, or heck, I mean, even the people that called their lawmaker just to say, this is important, you need to look at this bill and vote for it. Obviously, if you called the day before it passed, you didn't do a huge <laughs> amount, but people that for years have been calling lawmakers, getting voicemail, still leaving a message, or emailing, not getting a reply, but sending a follow-up. I think... Uh, it, our industry changed not because of the lawmakers. The industry changed because people wouldn't let the lawmakers not make that change. Yeah. And we, we, I mean, the thing is, is we've done a lot in the last few years, but we need to, uh, again, remember all of the people that were, I mean, normal, mm-hmm. Minnesota normal, Absolutely. their chapter started, what, in the 70s? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're going 50 years I mean, that's, that says a lot. I mean, yeah, we, we need to remember, you know, this, it wasn't five years ago that we started this. It wasn't four years ago. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we bring up Oliver a lot. Are there, I wonder who came before, you know? Yeah. Well, going back, I mean, like the founders of Minnesota Normal are no longer really actively involved in the state, at least the original version. One is now a lawyer, lawyer down in Florida the other one is still sort of in Minnesota, not as involved in cannabis. But, I mean, even going back to, like, the 60s and prior to that, there's court cases in the 40s of people shouting at judges because they got arrested for something and still got thrown in prison. But, hey, move the needle a they little made, bit. Yeah, made their voice heard, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break here. When we get back, I'm excited to dig a little bit into some of the products that you brought here and talk a little bit more about that industry council.
Very okay. cool. Hey, man, where are you? What do you mean, where are you? I'm here in the studio. We're getting ready for our class with Bovida. Oh, I thought you said Maple Grovida. Maple Grovida? No, man, we're doing a class with Bovida. April 15th, Ryan Rice, Matt Rabadou at the Wilderness. You know, we're going to teach you how to dry and cure your cannabis. And if you have an interest in commercial, we'll even teach you that. Marcus, if you can't make it in person, we even have a live stream. mncannabiscollege.org backslash curing has all the information you need. Tell you a little bit more about the class. Yeah, I can text that to you. All right, talk soon. And we're back. So along with doing the activism on the legislative side, you've also done a lot of organizing here in the community, including in that Minnesota Growers Cooperative and Industry Council. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and some of the work you do there? Sure. Um, the Minnesota Cannabis Growers Cooperative and Industry Council was originally founded by uh, Jim Erickson, Chadwick Lang, mm -hmm. and a couple other individuals. John Quincy Adams, right? John Quincy Adams. Um <laughs> Yeah, so it was started back in, I thought it was started in 2019, 2020, but now I was corrected. They didn't start until like 2021. A couple of farmers mm -hmm. in Southeast Minnesota. Um, I just recall sometime in 2021, I got an invite to come to a roundtable meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I first met uh, Jim Erickson. And, and after working with him, uh, and their leadership team, um, he actually asked me to take over the role of the president. Um, that, was, that was like going into 22 at that point. Yeah. Was that right around like the Loveland case? And it I was, think it was exactly during yeah, that Yeah, okay, totally. Because that, that was a big part of the roundtables. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were trying to, uh, it was a lot of information sharing, but it was also, we're trying to, generate consensus in the industry, mm -hmm. right? Because it, we were in the middle of that Delta 8 wave. Correct. Not quite on Delta 9, but we knew it was around. Yep, the Delta 8, the Delta 10, all the altnoids. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of, you know, I was invited to engage with the co-op, attended a handful of meetings, and then after a while, Jim asked me, uh, based off of, I guess my personality and my background, if I would be willing to drive or be the president of the co-op, help generate revenue streams, really get us situated. So that's how I got involved. Um, but the, the point of the co-op is twofold. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is your traditional agricultural co-op, like you have all over rural Minnesota, mm -hmm. where you share allocated resources. Um, you can have buying power, but... Uh, the the crutch was is how can we how can we commoditize our products mm -hmm. right and 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 if you look at a regular co-op the farmers bring the co-op the crop and the co-op brings the value mm -hmm. right? how do we add value can we make feed mill we can process it and that's the idea of the co-op the co-op was supposed to be a way for members to add value well a lot has changed since the early CBD days, um, we rebranded as the Cannabis Co-op at legalization because we saw a bigger vision of this co-op. It's going to be twofold, bringing uh, value to the hemp side as well as the marijuana side. On the hemp side, we're going to be focusing on the true industrial um, uh, grain and fiber and herd. Uh, one of our members is the Lower Medwakanton Sioux. They've got their hemp creep program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we uh, we carried grain contracts for them last year. Um, they a couple years ago they were planting grain, um, keeping the fiber or keeping the herd and sending the fiber and the grain off. They thought it was too cumbersome to manage that, so we says, okay, we'll carry the grain contracts. So that was one way we were able to add value. The co-op could generate revenue. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna continue to foster that on the grain side and the and the herd side, um, but on the cannabis side, we're wanting to let these micro business and meso businesses and 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 home growers add value to their crops without having to do significant investments on their own end, mm -hmm. right? Like, why does every single micro or meso or home grower need? Um, 
you know, air dryers. Why does everyone need their own extraction equipment? Oh, yeah. that's, and that's where the co-op really brings the value. Now, how is this exactly going to play out? We don't know, but the idea is there. Uh, we've now got over 200 members. Uh, we've got um, a decent amount of cash to at least start bringing on some resources and providing some resources. But um, but the idea is, is when you think about the Minnesota Cannabis Growers Co-op, it's no different than a, f- a farm word or harvest land mm. or CHS where you have a group of cannabis operators that are leveraging a pool of resources so that we all can exceed more effectively and efficiently. Very cool. Um, on the flip side of that, we have the industry council. Uh, we wanted to provide a venue for people that weren't necessarily on the supply chain side to have a place to call home. So when we look at MN as ready, um, that was driving a lot of stakeholder engagement to reach industry consensus to provide um, recommendations to the legislators. Mm-hmm. This industry council is no different. We want to uh, we want to achieve consensus on standards, whether it be quality, whether it be tracking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's it's an arm to make legislative recommendations. We want to make sure that if you're not on the supply chain side, but you are in the industry, the co-op mm-hmm. is still a home f- for you mm-hmm. because of the resources that we have around it. And then, of course, we're uh, our administrators are blunt strategies. They were instrumental in running MN as ready and the oh, legislation. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's great. Um, I think uh, you, we have the expo coming up, yeah. uh, which is in conjunction with, well, it's not in partnership with, mm-hmm. but the Office of Cannabis Management, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health, they're going to be there. Um, they're going to be... Um, engaging with stakeholders Mm -hmm. they're going to be there putting on presentations q a the co-op is we you know i don't want to say we want to be the driving force in the industry because i welcome anybody to develop that driving force Mm -hmm. but if you're a newbie coming in or if you're looking to help or engage i mean we don't want to say we're a one-stop shop but we're going to help you navigate Mm -hmm. and get you to the right people we want to be the face if we can have 500 farmers standing in consensus, mm-hmm. that's that's got some power. Absolutely. No, I think it's so true you're saying, like, I'm not the voice of the industry, but we together oh, are the voice yeah. of the industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that and that's one thing that I cannot say enough. I don't speak on behalf of the industry. Mm-hmm. I, I'm providing a message, but this isn't my message. Um, and, and now that we're getting into some of this... Uh, discussion of merit base versus lottery mm-hmm. we don't have consensus and so yeah. i'm not going to say that the co-op supports this or that mm-hmm. if if we don't have consensus we don't have a position totally fair yeah it was interesting for a long time i think it was legalized cannabis legalized cannabis that was sort of the only message and then once it sort of became a reality then it was like well oh i've my meant this you mean something entirely different than that and now it's sort of coming into legalization and implementation. I think yet again, we're sort of seeing that divide of we all want legalization. We all want an industry. But what are those steps to get there? Lots of ways to skin a cat or whatever the phrase is. Yeah, absolutely. So now that we're sort of coming into April of 2024, tell us a little bit more about what's coming down for Crested River this year. We're coming up to adult use. Is that sort of a toe you're dipping into or sort of what does that look like? I've already had one personal harvest, mm-hmm. um, so I'm thoroughly hey, enjoying. Go. I'm thoroughly <laughs> enjoying that. Um, yeah, we have every intention of applying for uh, a marijuana license. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm envisioning a micro or mezzo license. Mm. Uh, when that's going to happen, I don't know. Um, I mean, my business partner is like, we need to strategize. I'm like, we don't even know what the rules are yet. I mean, we can strategize if you want, but we're going to be strategizing again soon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, I mean, uh, so I want, I want to go into uh, adult use cannabis. Um, What that exactly looks like? Well, I've, I just know that there's so many variables that we're still trying to flush out that I cannot tell you what that picture looks like. Um, But I, I mean, there's no reason for us to jump out of the hemp industry. I mean, we manufacture for a number of companies. Uh, we've got a number of products that are well received on the market. There's no reason for us to stop that. Um, 
So um, I wonder how difficult that split is going to be for folks like you. I I wonder too. Um, but there's also some significant accounting issues behind the scenes that I haven't wrapped my head around. I understand it to a point, but I don't know, you know, all the ins and the outs. So um, for people that don't know, there's an IRX tax code 280E. Um, anything that is federally prohibited, uh, the IRS treats them completely different. So if I am a regular business selling candy, I can write off everything. Mm -hmm. Marketing, electricity, waste disposal, salaries, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. When you're in the marijuana industry, you can only write off the specific cost of goods sold. So you don't get to write off your operating expenses. You don't get to write off marketing. Mm -hmm. When you pay your accountant $1,000 to do your taxes, you can't write that off. And so we're going from maybe a 15 to 20% tax rate closer to like a 70 or 80% effective tax rate. That is difficult to achieve. Yeah. Um, now, Especially when you're having success and you're driving the industry forward just even on the low dose side. Well, yeah, so, I mean, if I'm now able to operate a low dose and enjoy some of those tax breaks, but still manufacture marijuana mm -hmm. and kind of hedge those tax issues, that's the ideal situation. Mm -hmm. If I would be 50% hemp, 50% marijuana, I think on paper that would be ideal because I'm maximizing my, yeah. my, my tax potential. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Still remains to be seen, but um, so what we're doing in the meanwhile is um, we're just continuing to put out our own products. Um, we launched the the Minnesota line, which is the the sister to our standard Crested River full flavor soda pop, ten milligram multiple cannabinoids, um, where we're going into natural cane sugar, low potency. So this is you know more entry level versus when I first released our Crested River, it was to fill a gap saying, hey, mm -hmm. you smoke, I smoke, you want a pop, let's enjoy a pop. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist at yeah. the time. Well, and that forbidden fruit one, I remember buying that at Legacy and being like, oh, CBG, like, all right, I'll give it a go. And taking it home and being like, wow, this actually tastes good. Like there's a lot of products in the industry that get the job done. But mm -hmm. I think especially in that early moving part, a lot from local breweries, not throwing shade, but that weren't very good. It's nice having good tasting products. Yeah, no, I'll admit, like, we had no desire to do a beverage. Mm -hmm. We were going to let the beverage manufacturers do it, but everything was two to three milligram, maybe a five milligram out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can swear on this podcast. Absolutely. But everything tasted like fucking shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> everything. Oh, yeah. And, and 10 to 12 to $15. Mm -hmm. Anybody that smokes more than once a month or once a week is going to need something more. So, um, I didn't jump on the bandwagon. I didn't think. I went and said, hey, I want a full flavor beverage mm -hmm. that gets me to where I want to go and at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we entered the market with our 20 milligram THC beverages and we were selling them for $4 a can. And then I quickly was told that I can't do that. <laughs> Not by a, a regulator, but a, by an actual uh, retailer. Yeah. So we had, we were getting turned away from stores saying, you know, we can't sell that here for that price. I'm like, well, what price do you want to sell it? You can sell it for whatever you want. Well, then you have to raise your price, Sean, or else it makes us look bad. Interesting. So I, I play the game, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I mean, that's with every industry. Like here, folks, I'm not trying to talk down about any, anybody's model. Oh, absolutely. But I had a model that I wanted to come to market with to, you know, fill of a gap. And I had to take a step back and I had to dance with the industry or else, you know, mm -hmm. I would have been blackballed. Yeah. I mean, no one's bigger than the industry, but you can always try to innovate and, and lead with what you think works, but not everyone will receive you when, when it comes to the decision that they have to yeah. make. And now here we are. Um, almost two years later and the market is starting to settle down. Mm -hmm. But is that driven by ethical pricing or competition, right? Mm -hmm. Now we are going from 10 options to 50 options to 500 options. Um, a lot of jockeying for shelf space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now the prices are starting to come down. A lot of buy one, get ones type of a thing. So 
Can you talk us through a little bit? I think a lot of brands go to start a beverage and they go and find someone that sort of has that canning facility are excited to start that brand and do it that route. You actually went through the entire process of like setting up an entire canning line. Can you talk about what the motivating factor was behind that? Well, the motivating factor was um, we wanted to release a beverage for the market that would meet uh, a need that wasn't being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Uh, We worked with an outfit in St. Louis Park. We did one batch. Um, After that batch, I made the decision to set up our own line because these were alcohol guys. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand cannabis. Um, and I just knew that we could do it better. I mean, they wanted to charge me $2 a can just to can it. Okay, totally. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, that's ridiculous. They're like, well, you guys are charging this much on the industry. And I'm like, yeah, they're charging this much in the industry. Right. The fact that like we should be charging 35 cents a can. Right. Oh yeah. It's crazy to see breweries that enter the market and realize like, wait, these are the margins on cannabis? Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Because it, it is. It is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. So, um, and it won't last. And it won't last. So I set up a canning, our own canning line specifically because I wanted more control. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't going to let the status quo, you know, dictate what the market saw. Um, you know, I want to show all of these big breweries that are doing a 1,000 cases at a time that this outfit that's doing a couple hundred cases at a time can put out a good product and have all the compliance documents. Cause that was the other thing to find a certificate of analysis on any one of these products on the market. I mean, it was Zelda's quest. Mm-hmm. You would be able to find like certificates for the input ingredients, but not f- nothing for the finished ingredient. And, yeah. and then of course, because I'm an outspoken person in the industry, I would, approach these breweries and say, Hey, where's your certificate of analysis? Oh, do you have any idea how much that costs? I'm like, in fact, I know exactly how much that costs. <laughs> oh, yeah. And 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 I'm doing batches 30% less than you. That means my costs should be about 30% more than yours. Mm-hmm. I have no problem doing it. What is the problem with you not doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and and after, you know, a lot of conversation and a lot of, you know, people not liking me and flicking me off, we were finally able to get them to start putting out compliance documents. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it was awesome. Um, but that was one of the reasons, yeah. Why did I set up my own canning line? To drive change in the industry mm-hmm. and to instill a proper professional culture, which I felt was not present. Interesting. Yeah, I remember being at a Department of Labor meeting with you and Charlene Briner and Chris Folks were sitting next to each other and both were talking about you scan this QR code and it brings you to some website or sometime to a Google Drive with like 600 documents in it. And like that, that doesn't count as compliance. And no. it's been interesting having people figure out like what does a compliant product look like and how do you actively follow the rules that exist in our industry? Yeah. So it's been a couple of years since I've been out to your facility. When you say you have a canning line, are you able to produce everything for the beverage right there? Yep. So we, we fill the tanks with water, ingredients, uh, emulsion. Uh, we, we chill it down. Uh, we carbonate it. We hook it up to our, our canning machine. And, you know, on, uh, on a really dialed in product, we can do a case a minute. Um, mm-hmm. In some instances where we're doing already labeled cans, like this is a happy can. Uh, this is a root beer that we're doing for Iowa now. So we're in Iowa. Nice. This is a brand in Iowa. Their, their legislation says four milligrams per serving. So, um, so this is a pre-printed can. I mean, we can do 27 cans a minute Hmm. where we're just filling and sealing. Sure. Uh, whereas when we have to put a label on it, our label is the bottleneck there. So we can only get up to about a case a minute, but Mm -hmm. yeah, we do everything turnkey. Um, do you identify as a brewery? I do not identify as a brewery. I identify as a cannabis company. I dig it. So sort of wrapping up today, I'm just curious. You have introduced me to a number of cannabis products over the years, not just like a vapes and smokables, but like teaching me about different terpene profiles, teaching me about different cannabinoids. Do you sort of have a favorite that you utilize in your life or sort of what's your go-to cannabis product if you were to, to use one? 
So I'm a habitual smoker. I thoroughly enjoy smoking flour. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not big into vaping. Um, I seen you have a um, puffco. Over the there, puffco. Yeah. So I I do have a puffco, and and I do do some concentrates. But even when I do dabs, it's like I gotta follow it up with at least a one hitter to okay. get that totally. flower hit right. <laughs> um, for over the counter products, I'm big into beverages. I love the beverages. Um, the the uptake is quicker than an edible, mm-hmm. um, and I've effectively cut alcohol out of my system. Um, nice. I mean i I was never a big drinker. Uh, while consuming cannabis, but now, yeah, it's, it's effectively cut out. Like I'll, I'll grab a four pack before I go home. I mean, it, I don't know if it's healthy or not. I used to not, not that I ever drank after work, Mm -hmm. but now it feels like I drink after work (laughs) because I, I bring home a four pack and I consume a four pack after work. Like people used to do with their six packs of beer. Absolutely. (laughs) I love that. Well, and what I love is that like, I don't know if when they brought us into the studio of the Dabbler Depot knew how anti, not anti-alcohol, but how I think people have found that cannabis can be sort of that alcohol replacement to so many parts of their life, be it socially or be it just sort of relaxing at the end of the day. Um, you know, my dad likes his Manhattan or whatever drink. Mm-hmm. I like my cannabis. It's the same type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a flower guy. Uh, I, I, I like the drinks because they get you to where you need to be. Um, and then like, my last harvest was a Maui Waui. Okay. Um, so I like the old school genetics. Mm-hmm. You know, I can appreciate all the new hybrids, but I don't know. There's, I'm not, I even made the comment this weekend. I don't think I'm nostalgic anymore in my old age, but I'm now realizing like, no, I like the nostalgic strains, even though they were probably, you know, out of popularity after I started smoking. It's just the idea of these these old school strains. So I like gas too, like San Fernando Valley OG. Okay. Totally. That's a really good one. I think you're an original, Sean. Well, I try to be, I mean, if, if I'm like anybody else, then just, I don't know. OG in the hemp game, but early and still working in the cannabis game. Trying, mm-hmm. trying, but yeah, no, uh, it's been a gas. I love it. Well, thank you so much for making the drive in today. Thank you so much for chatting with us a little bit. For those wanting to learn a little bit more about your company or connect with you, where would you send them online to learn a bit more? Uh, check out crestedriver.com. Um, otherwise, we also have Minnesota, M-I-N-I, soda, criver.cc, minnesota.cc. Um. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for coming in. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, right on. <laughs> Oh, thanks for having me. We'll edit this part. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely cut this out. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so uh, touching a little bit on that activism side, 